Welcome to a special episode of Anglican Unscripted, episode 321, the Friday edition, the uh, Women's Orders edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today, September 8th, 2017. Okay, welcome to a special program. Uh, geez, for the last five, six, seven years, uh, the ACNA has fretted one decision. What will all the bishops do when they're in a room and they have to decide about women's orders? And the first decision they had was, well, we're going to put together a task force. And that task force, the job is to kick this down the road, uh, at least until you know a certain archbishop can retire and not worry about it, and maybe put this into GAFCON's hands and do this on an Anglican communion-wide uh, basis. And that was successful. We had the report issued uh, this spring, and we got to read it. It uh, certainly talked about both issues of women's or, uh, orders and holy orders uh, within and uh, around the church and other denominations. And it was well received. Uh, I don't know how many people actually read it like George and I had to. Um, and now we have today a decision, uh, more of a statement. It didn't really come out as a decision, George. A statement from the House of Bishops of the Anglican Church in North America issued from Vancouver. And what did that statement say, George? The College of Bishops statement said that after considerable study, they would not have won mind. And that while there was no scriptural warrant for women priests, However, they believed that the uh, call to unity was such that they needed to allow dioceses to continue to make their own decisions on this issue. So at the end of the day, they've decided not to decide. Now, a pessimist or a cynic can say, well, they're just kicking a can down the road. Now, that would be a justified conclusion if their considerations were purely political. In other words, we have to be seen to be together so therefore we're going to decide not to decide in the in order to preserve the institution if that was their motivation then they're just prevaricating however what they specifically said in their statement is that they have been praying about this and trying to seek the lord's will and they're not there yet so that rather than take a precipitous step that breaks fellowship with people whom they recognize as being full brothers and sisters in Christ over this, they're not going to force this issue until God has spoken to them as a body, as a college. So I am more inclined to take the high road and believe what they're saying. Yeah, I am too. You and I predicted, um, once the task force came out, that this year they would vote on something that they would meet, they would have, you know, I didn't expect a conclave, that was kind of cool, um, but they would you know, gather and finally discuss this issue uh, ad nauseum until uh, they had time to do something. And this is you know, what they've chosen to do for now. It should also be noted that the House of Bishops really did not have the authority to change the constitution and canons uh, of the ACNA at this meeting. There's more of a yes. process, process involved. So if we were reading right now, um, the House of Bishops has decided uh, though, to have a uh, memorandum or, or a halt to uh, women's orders. That wouldn't happen. That, that is more of a process to that. You're technically correct. Uh, they could issue, say, that we are enacting a moratorium. Mm -hmm. However, it has to pass through the constitutional channels. But by the very fact that they're saying we're doing a moratorium, they're the ones that ordain <laughs> people, it has a practical effect. It does. So, so yes, I mean... Uh, you're right, technically, but I really wouldn't, uh, if you want to play hard politic, political numbers, the numbers are there, clearly there, amongst the members of the College of Bishops to block the ordination of women. If they wanted to force the issue politically, the numbers are there to get rid of women clergy, to grandfather them in, to basically say so long, or whatever. In other words, if you were going to play, have a political solution, the, the issue is, what do we do about the existing women clergy and about those dioceses that are going to cry foul? Mm -hmm. However, they decided not, you 
as they say, because they're not led by spiritual. Uh, they're not led in the spirit to make a final conclusive decision, and therefore they're not going to be presumptuous to say, uh, because I believe this profoundly, therefore it's the Holy Spirit speaking, therefore this is what they're going to do. They're moving by... It, they're, they're being true to being a college of bishops, yeah. which is a collegial, conciliar, consensus-driven body. And consensus is not. You and I talked about this a couple of years ago on the the level of the Anglican Communion, where there's two minds of this. Um, it's not a first order issue; it's not a salvation issue. And I think this would confirm that. Well, if you look, well, let's just first focus on within GAFCON mm -hmm. because women's orders has taken different forms in different places. Mm -hmm. In some of the more liberal provinces, women orders has been a stalking horse for a wider, as Gavin Ashenden would say, cultural Marxist agenda. That women's orders are intrinsically tied into uh, the gay movement and so on and so on and so forth. That is not the case in East Africa, for example. The East African revival that began in the 1930s that has seen women be priests in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, and the Sudan, and I believe in Rwanda and Burundi as well, women um, were amongst the forefront of that East African revival so that the culture of those churches, the evangelical churches, was one of no uh, distinction between male or female. Those churches in Africa that were planted and uh, fostered by the Catholic mission societies, specifically the university's missions to Central Africa or the uh, USP, USPG, they have, a more, they have a different understanding of holy orders than the evangelical provinces. So we can't make blanket statements about women's orders within even within the GAFCON world because it makes uh, you know some of the arguments that we hear from Anglo Catholics on the issue uh, would cause uh, East African uh, evangelicals to scratch their heads saying I have no clue what you're talking about yeah and that's that's a reality of GAFCON and the Anglican Communion for that matter um, one of the things that was decided early on when they were going to talk about this was after a decision was made, they would pass it on to GAFCON uh, for their, I don't know, approval or oversight or... Before we get there, let's sure. contrast how the Church of England did it. Oh, yeah, that'll be fine. <laughs> the, Church of, the Church of England did the theological homework and basically agreed that they couldn't agree on it. Right. Then Welby and company, uh, Justin Welby in particular, said, I'm going to take, I'm going to make the take the political steps to ensure that this happens. And then we're going to play by a numbers game. Right. Well, that, we're, we're now we're talking about women bishops, not just uh, uh, women clergy. Well, I think women bishops is, free, is, is close enough that many people will know, have more ideas. Okay, sure. All right. yeah. um, but it was essentially the same strategy with women priests with George Carey, uh, who was the archbishop who, who brought that in. Um, Welby has adopted a, uh, a, an overt agenda of uh, jobs for the boys. In other words, uh, if we have a male bishop, we've got to have a female bishop. And now the House of Bishops of the Church of England, by and large, is a mediocre group of people. That they're uh, not... They're not an impressive group. And the, the joke of it is that the Church of England has chosen mediocre women uh, to become the first bishops. Uh, and that sort of the more aggressive, hard-charging, dynamic, left-wing women who in the Episcopal Church were elected bishops, they've been sidetracked for women company men, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. No, it does. I mean, uh, he wanted to stay away from the edges. You know, the edges would be, you know, uh, conservative evangelical or I'm going to use this as a, it's a holy term, wacko liberal. And uh, he just stayed away from those edges in, in choosing um, through the, the panel that chooses bishops uh, who they were going to have serve them. The of England was that uh, 
everybody clouds everything they do with, oh, the spirit is moving us. Yeah, 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 that's right. But the ACNA is seeking to be the, they do not want to be the mirror image of, say, the Church of England of the Episcopal Church in, in moving in knee-jerk response. And so that when they say that the spirit has led us to the conclusion that want people to actually believe them, rather than just say, yeah, 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 this is just church talk and nobody believes you, but this is just the way the political system works. So I, uh, whatever your, whatever our viewers' personal views on this matter, I think, I think we can all agree that the way they've gone about dealing with this is a godly way. Now, we may not agree or we may be wildly in agreement with the conclusion they've reached, but the process, I think, is impressive. And I say this as someone who is an outsider from the ACNA. I'm impressed by the desire to seek the Lord's will. I'm impressed by this, uh, the votes being unanimous. You know, that at the end of the day, there's not a minority report. There's not one person who's just, uh, I'm fighting for, you know, my cause till death. Um, that they're doing this in unity as best as possible. Obviously, it's a difficult um, topic uh, for the church still. Um, I don't think this is the end of the issue within the ACNA, but this is a, a chance to say, you know, a, a group of men who certainly had uh, the votes to change uh, uh, on paper the way the ACNA uh, does women's orders chose to take a different route than what was predicted. Kevin, I think it was, was it 2015 or 2014 that you and I went to, uh, was it Montreat, North Carolina? Yeah, it was it down in North Carolina where Ridgecrest, North Carolina. Ridgecrest, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And you and I would sit at table, and we once had breakfast with a fellow, an REC bishop named Sam Siemens. Mm -hmm. And Sam just had an audience of two, and he went off on you know, the Antichrist is going to become as a woman priest. And We're kind of hyperboil this, but yeah, I mean, uh, he had, was then, very opinionated. Um, uh, and uh, in his his uh, understanding of uh, women's orders, we then, uh, that lunch the same day, sat at a table uh, uh, of some uh, wonderful uh, friends of ours from Trinity. And we got a different perspective, George. Trinity Seminary in Ambridge. Yeah. And we uh, got as a, a more sophisticated, but just as hard-nosed. And passionate. And so that if you were going to ask me in 24, whenever it was, 2014, 2015, I was still a cripple then. Uh, hey, you I were walking around with your little walk, your little canes, and people are like, Is, did he have a car accident? No. No, I just drink heavily, and now it's, it's right. catching up. <laughs> If you had asked me this question then, I would have said, okay, it's going to blow up. It's not going to work because you have two irreconcilable, uh, you have two people, you have two camps of goodwill. Mm -hmm. In other words, I can't point to one to say they're cranks, they're kooks, they're nuts, uh, though there's a great temptation to do so. Uh, and they're not going to be able to come across. Here we are three, four years later. And they have avoid, and these are this. This is that level of leadership, and that level of leadership has come to a unanimous decision that the Lord has not spoken definitively to them. And to make that statement requires a degree of theological and spiritual maturity. Again, you may not agree with the outcome, but I think I, I would challenge anyone who would uh, question the dignity and integrity of how they've gone. Well, we were not at the meeting, in the meeting, could not record the meeting, so we don't know what happened. I am sure there's bishops flying home today who do not agree with the final decision, uh, the final outcome. Um, but I think there's a lot of them who are relieved that you know there was a, a single decision and they got they get to fly home in unity. They're not worried that the uh, ACNA is going to crack up by Christmas um, and there's those deep divisions. Um, they understand, I would hope, that there's still going to be, this is still going to be a issue on the lips of a lot of clergy and laity uh, within the ACNA. Uh, this was came out an hour ago on Facebook, and Facebook is melting down, or uh, Anglican Inc. server is melting down. 
uh, because it's an important issue to people. Now, let's sort of shift gears, and now we can be cynical and political. <laughs> okay, and, uh, okay, that's good. All right, yeah. um, let's just do sort of the what ifs. What if they had said, okay, moratorium on women's orders, and now we're going to figure out what that looks like? Meaning, okay. we grandfather in. Quick answer. Even the people who oppose women's orders would say it doesn't go far enough. There are people uh, out there who do, will not be happy. In other words, do we uh, disfellowship the existing women priests? Mm -hmm. Do we allow them, we don't take any more? We only allow them to act, uh, function as deacons? In other words, that would be the, and what would be the ramifications in a political world? First off, it would hand a victory to the critics of the ACNA on the far left and the far right. In other words, uh, the bloggers, liberal bloggers from the Episcopal Church side would say, see, we told you so, they're, they've always been misogynists, and now, they're, now that nobody's looking, their true colors have come out. And then you would have the people on the continuing church side who, who would say, look, these people are, have, sh have admitted that they are impure, and everything they have touched is compromised. You need to come to the holy, true, Anglican Orthodox Church of Okeechobee, Florida, which is the only act, true Anglican church in America. You would have gotten that sort of nonsense. And now this is something that's going to upset some people, but I'm on the board of the Diocese of Central Florida, an Episcopal Diocese, uh, and I'm privy to things that go on. Uh, we've, in conversations with our uh, deploy, Diocese of Central Florida has no prop, we We've ordained 21 people in the last nine months, and we are able to place them. They get jobs, and we are, every job opening we have, we get people from all across the Episcopal Church wanting to move to Central Florida. We've also had about two or three dozen ACNA priests sort of quietly asking, can we come back on board? Um, why? Well, each case is probably unique and individual. So far, none have done so. But um, if the women are kicked out, enough, some of them, I don't know if all of them, are going to go and want to come back into the Episcopal Church, into the safe diocese. Mm -hmm. Dallas, that ordained women. Dallas, Central Florida, so on and so forth. And that would be a political fiasco. Because essentially uh, there is no difference functionally uh, in the day-to-day -day life, an Episcopal priest in Central Florida and an ACNA priest in terms of doctrine, discipline, beliefs, and so on and so forth. We just have screwy people in charge in New York. You have less screwy people charge in, what, Ambridge. Or whatever. <laughs> if, if, if you start seeing people going back into the Episcopal Church, I think that would be a political PR and be fiasco. It would. I mean, there are places, I, I think in Canada, where um, I know a large proportion of certain places have uh, female clergy. I know some dioceses that uh, maybe 10% uh, are female clergy, and that's a, a very difficult situation uh, and going forward. the bishops forward. of the Atlantic and the bishop of Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and I think there might be one other, are married to female deacons. Of course, they're female deacons. They would. Well, one's a priest, I think. But okay, yeah. Um, uh, uh, so that you know that this really would be problematic on many levels. Yeah. So that so even if you just take the hard-nosed cynical approach of, and this is kicking the can. It's a wise political step, um, because to, as you say, Kevin. The cranky guys with the fuzzy beards on the internet who post wonderfully flaming comments, no matter what they do, they're going to threaten, well, I'm going to join the Orthodox Church and move to a monastery in Alaska. Yeah. yeah. If you haven't done it now, you're not going to do it. No, I, I, th I, there's truth to that. A lot of people said, I'm going to wait for the decision, and if it's not what I want, I'm leaving. And of those, I think four or five really will. But if you haven't left already, you're, you're probably not going to leave Uh based on, on today's news. Now, George and I sat down almost two and a half hours ago to, to record today's episode, not knowing this would break uh, as a, uh, a press release and that we would do a live show uh, 
I think I've brushed my teeth. Yeah, we're good. Um, so we, we weren't prepared to, to sit here live and we discussed what we we're going to talk about. And we wanted to talk about this morning, the contrast between a strong ACNA and a weak GAFCON. I think uh, the answer to North America is as strong as it's ever been. Um, this decision and how it's been handled kind of proves that. And GAFCON in many ways, visually, uh, from what we see is struggling and I thought you know we would be talking a little bit about that and we were going to kind of juxtapose that with Welby um, and uh, some later statement from the ACC let's do that now in talking about um, I don't think GAFCON would have been able to handle uh, a different decision from the ACNA politically no uh, Uganda for instance has uh, women clergy, uh, ready to be bishops, who have served 20 years, who have senior level experience. And the Ugandan church has agreed to a moratorium. Uh, Kenya, under Eliud Wabakula, had women uh, stand for ordination, to, election to the episcopate, and Eliud basically said, okay, we will not do this uh, until things are settled down. Now, I don't know what the current policy is. Um, Nigeria doesn't have women bishops, women clergy at all. Um, South America doesn't have it, except for Uruguay, of course. They're, they were given a local option. So how the, you know, the international repercussions of, uh, of, a, of a botched decision would have been very, very strong. And uh, so I think they've, they've, they've helped GAFCON by this action. Okay, we have got needs all the help. Yeah, of course. Oh, well, we've just been updated by uh, Mary Ailes, a, a friend of the program. She says, for your information, and she's speaking just to you, George, not me, uh, Sherry Hobby and Meg uh, Guernsey are priests, not deacons. And so uh, it's nice that we have a live studio audience that can uh, update us. Well, uh, for your information, they're also deacons, <laughs> as well as. Oh, wow. <laughs> the world of technicalities. Um, so let's talk a little Thank bit. Thank you for that. I, I, had, I can't keep all these things in my head. At Not the for a live time. program. I don't know, but we need to tell our people about once every third program, we have to go through at least three tries. Um, so we're getting lucky so far today. Um, let's talk about the... Let's talk about what the problem is. What's the problem? With sure. GFK? Yeah, the, the, the inherent weaknesses. What, well, as we say, Gaf ACNA politically, uh, structurally, is much stronger. It's the strong man now, and GAFCON is the institution is the weak one. Why? Gaf uh, ACNA has depth. It has its House of Bishops has acted unanimously. When Foley Beach speaks, everybody knows that he is speaking on behalf for the organization, and that's where it is. Mm -hmm. When Nicholas Oko speaks for GAFCON, he is speaking as Nicholas Oko, and not all the GAFCON primates will come along. And, uh, and they may agree, they may not agree. So when Nicholas Oko released a statement saying, I'm not going to the primates meeting, uh, he only is now joining uh, Uganda because uh, Kenya, Uga uh, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, South Sudan, North Sudan, Congo, <coughs> Um, probably South America will probably go. There's no unanimity because GAFCON at this stage is, is a collection of primates. There's no depth to it. And with the constant rotation of primates, they're not able to build history and work collegially. Um, no, and that's, that's the truth. I mean, if GAFCON in the early stages had said, we need to set up a structured organization uh, much like a denomination, uh, perfect example here in America, the Episcopal Church has built in an infrastructure um, that's, despite uh, its its issues, is legally binding. Uh, a diocese is uh, a container of churches, and the churches serve uh, at, at the the whim of the diocese. The diocese serves tech. It's all written into the constitutions. If we could have constitutional um, bylaws that. Uh, ascertain some authority to GAFCON on behalf of these provinces, it would be much uh, more beneficial and there would be less primate turnover that would affect GAFCON. I agree with the, in principle, with the point that you, you raise. Mm -hmm. 
and I think you've raised an important point, which is that, uh, for instance, we've West Africa was a member of the Afghan under uh, Justice uh, Akrofi. His successor, uh, Daniel, uh, I think it's Yinka, uh, Archbishop Daniel, uh, has been cultivated by uh, the Church of England and the Episcopal Church for years, so that when he became Archbishop, West Africa pulled out. Um, when uh, Eliud Wabakula retired, Jackson Oli Sapet came in, and because he is a weak primate, not that he's a weak person, but because he's a member of the Maasai tribe, and he's young, and the focus of power is in Nairobi, and he's an outsider, and he has not been able to get everybody on board with his agenda, he has not been able to keep Kenya within the fold. I expect uh, Kenya to drop out of Gafcon eventually, mm -hmm. if, if, if the trajectory stays the same. You shared an incident where you, a, a friend of yours, an Akna bishop, had a, an acquaintance friend from Kenya visit, and uh, they were discussing the Scottish Episcopal Church gay marriage issue. And the Kenyan bishop said, as he said, I know as a matter of fact, because I have been told by people in the Episcopal Church that, Kenya, that Scotland has not done this, 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 and this. And Bill Murdoch was flat. Uh, <laughs> Bishop X uh, was uh, flabbergasted mm -hmm. that this fellow believed this, but there was no counter information stream. There was no depth to the GAFCON to keep people on side or on board. So that the information that they have uh, could not be challenged. Now, it's not that all of a sudden Kenya has switched sides or there's just a ch giant moral shift in their, their church, but rather GAFCON has been too primate-focused and too Eurocentric. My now, the good news is uh, Justin Welby is at his weakest point. Uh, oh, yeah. Since his election, if you want to, you know, look at yeah, Gafcon saving trouble, ACNA is on top of the world. Um, the the press has been brutal to our our good friend Archbishop Justin Welby, uh, especially the last two weeks, George. It, now, in the past, it's just been you, me, and Gavin who have been brutal to Justin Welby in a loving, sweet sort yeah, of way, like oh, romance. Stay here, come on. Love that guy. As my mother-in-law tells my <laughs> wife, Susan, there's still time for him to go to law school. There's still time. There's uh, <laughs> Justin Welby, uh, recently, I think for me, the tipping point, uh, read Malcolm Glad Gladwell's book, Tipping Point, if you don't know what I'm talking about, about tipping point, but tipping point, uh, or as they would say, when Fonzie jumped the shark, that the, yeah, the, the, happy days we have the jump the shark moment here. The shark was jumped in a recent Spectator art, art, article by Quentin Letts, I believe, who basically said, "What is the point of Justin Welby?" And totally outside the world of church, the things that you and I and Gavin and our compatriots talk about, mm -hmm. Quentin Letts, who is a practicing uh, Christian member of the Church of England basically said Justin Welby is ridiculous and here we have a survey that I believe you and Gavin discussed mm -hmm. about what a minute portion of the population are practicing Anglicans or believing Anglicans and the first thing out of Justin Welby's mouth the next day is wow socialist economic policy something totally inane and and Justin Welby, in this, for The Spectator, has become a person of ridicule. Now, dictators can and do thrive on opposition. Mm -hmm. They like those fights. When they are ridiculed, that is, that's when things, that's when they know things are bad. Um, ridicule. Oop, you got a visitor? <laughs> uh, no. Sorry, I'm the phone right. Okay. I should play some music here. Okay, um, and that's true. Justin Welby has proved the irrelevance that so many people have predicted for so long. Um, you and I had a big romance for Justin when he was first nominated and then elected, and we're like, "This is cool." 
he's one of us, he's an alpha guy, he's uh, evangelical. What could good go wrong? Because we were so used to um, the uh, insidiousness of Roland Williams, the liberal Catholic, the uh, <laughs> Druid, uh, and those things. And so when Justin came along, we fully supported him. But I remember certain bloggers right in the beginning said, this guy is dirt. He's not going to do anything for the Church of England. He's not going to unite us. He will further divide us. And I was like, gosh, you're kind of overly critical. He's not even in office yet. They were dead right, George. They were. And I think it comes down to leadership. And it goes back what we were talking about the ACNA. The ACNA has been blessed with two archbishops now who have exercised leadership and vision and have been able to guide a group of very disparate people into a common mission and purpose. Mm -hmm. Justin Welby's leadership is that of a mid-level manager who is looking to consolidate power rather than to empower his subordinates or his co-workers. And because of that, Justin Welby has managed to squelch dissent. The uh, sort of mediocre Me Too Yes Men in the Church of England, that, uh, that unkind uh, stereotype is now just over, taken over completely. Um, you know, we, we saw it when, when Gavin Ashenden, for instance, uh, was basically pressed to step down as a chaplain to the queen because he was saying truths about Islam. Um, he was saying nothing that was contrary to Christian doctrine. He was just being politically awkward for the conservative government and uh, the church bureaucrats. When you have a church, when you have leadership like that, that looks for the short-term political solution, the institution's done for. All right. Let's do one more topic before we finish up. Um, when the ACNA was formed, a lot of people said, well, what is Canterbury going to do? Are they going to accept us as a province? Are they going to consider us Anglican? Um, there was a uh, delegate's uh, uh, submission under Rowan Williams that would say, hey, uh, we recognize uh, the ACNA that went through and was studied. Rowan Williams put out a paper that said, Anglicanism is more than that. It's more of diocese to diocese relationships. And if you're not a diocese, you can't recognize another diocese. So even if I, Rowan Williams, said that ACNA was a province, they wouldn't be a province because they don't have diocese relationships yet. <sighs> I know. We are now to the point where uh, there's such rumors that the ACNA is a province that uh, uh, Justice, what's his, how do you pronounce his name? Okay, thank you, George. Um, made a statement uh, this week that said, you're kidding. Once again, for the final time, ACNA is not the uh, 40th province of the Anglican Communion. And at that point, I said, Whew. you know, after Justin and all the crowd has absolutely decimated uh, the Church of England and, and what it means to be an Anglican, uh, I'm kind of glad that they, they finally came out with this official statement, George. Well, let's put it this way. The ACNA is much a province of the Anglican Communion or a member of the Anglican Consultative Council as Josiah Diwoferon is an archbishop. Amen. It's... Meaning, he's not an archbishop. Even though he likes to use that title, he got fired from that job. And it's sort of bad taste to continue to refer to yourself after you've been demoted uh, and ACNA is not and has never claimed to be a member of the Anglican Consultative Council. That is the definition as I will Ferron is using. As you have pointed out, the definition set forth by Rowan Williams was of diocese to diocese relationship. And then we have membership in the Anglican Consultative Council. And then we have invitations to the Lambeth Conference. We have all these various that uh, overlapping and non-overlapping definitions of what it means to be an Anglican. And no one has the authority to say who is or who is not a member of the Anglican Communion except for 
the Anglican Consultative Council can define its membership. But that is not the same thing as a member of the Anglican Communion, being part of the ACC. Okay. Now, for the last four years of programs, we've normally started out a program with a weather forecast, what it's been like here and what it's been like in Florida. Um, George, a lot of people, I got a couple emails here, are wondering why you have not evacuated the area yet. Uh, you may not, may or may not have heard the news, if you're a Weather Channel fan. There's a hurricane named Erna heading right your way. Well, what's going on, George? Well, two answers. One, I don't know if our viewers know this, but I am rector of the highest church, the Episcopal Church of Florida. You know, in the 70s, that meant something completely different. <laughs> Well, yes, we are about a hundred and a little over a hundred feet over sea level. Mm, that's a bad. Uh, we are on the Central Florida Ridge, mm -hmm. so that if uh, the Grand Volcano in Tenerife explodes and we have a tidal wave, the water will come up, will wash over all of Florida except us. Uh, well, two reasons. One, uh, the uh, while we are doing our pre-tape pre-show, uh, my phone kept ringing. And my cell phone because our local sheriff issued an evacuation order for areas along the coast east of Highway 19 in the town of Crystal River. We're inland. We're much higher elevation, and we are where people are evacuating to. Uh, the other thing is that a good priest doesn't take off uh, because I've got uh, because we have a policy in the diocese: hurricane warning, hurricane watch, mm -hmm. no services. Mm -hmm. And we let, sent that out to people at the beginning of the week, everyone on email, and those who didn't have email, we telephoned. And after the storm passes, uh, I get out in my, S, in my mother's SUV and uh, go visit all the vulnerable people. Um, while we had a pre-show, uh, Kevin, uh, I was interrupted for about 15 minutes because I have an elderly man uh, with PTSD has diabetes, he's on oxygen, he lives alone with his dog, and he got a message from the sheriff's office he has to evacuate. And he was hysterical, what do I do, where do I go, I have no family, I have no money, this and that. And I walked him through the steps that he would take, that you know, we, we do the evacuation up to 48 hours before, call the sheriff's department, they will take you to the shelter you can bring your dog, bring the dog food, and you know, I will follow up with you after the storm to make sure you're home and everything's okay. Part of my job as a priest with an older congregation is that I go to everybody's house and I contact everybody after the storm. Mm -hmm. So the idea that I evacuate is contrary to... Uh, now, if it were an issue of safety, if I were on Miami Beach right now, I would evacuate. Oh yeah, hey. because I am not in a flood zone, the church or my residence, it's incumbent upon me to stay for my people. We do want to thank you all for your time. You sat with us for a good forty-one minutes. So we did our special live show, uh, talking about the House of Bishops and their uh, statement on women's orders in the Anglican Church in North America. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 321, live from Hurricane Irma on Anglican Unscripted.